you have your hymnals, I encourage you to turn to 160, turn to page 160. We're going to continue our, our Advent reading this morning. And uh, this, mess, this uh, third Sunday of Advent uh, is titled, Messiah Brings Salvation. I'm excited about this one. If you have your page open, say amen. 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 All right. Sounds like everybody. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release darkness, re release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. And the garment of grace instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness. Planting of the Lord for the display of the splendor. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion. For great is the Holy One of Israel. Six, 61. Let's stand together as we go to prayer. Lord Jesus, I am thankful. I hope we're all thankful for the gift of salvation that you've given to us, Lord Jesus. It's a gift that, said, that you say, whoever believes on me will not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, thank you. Lord, it's a wonderful call that we can uh, believe on you, Lord, with, with faith. We don't have to, to do all these different works, Lord, to be saved. You bring salvation to us, Lord Jesus, a free gift for you. It wasn't free to you, Lord. Your son had to die on the cross for our sins. And help us, Lord, uh, to treasure the gift of salvation and to, and to build our lives uh, in uh, wanting to serve you, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would help us, Lord Jesus, you're the God of our salvation. Help us to, to trust in you fully, Lord Jesus, to build our lives in honoring you. Help us to be thankful for your wonderful gift this year. I pray that you would just be with us in all that we do. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please stand and worship this song. Turn to 165. 165. <laughs>
Would you stand with me together for prayer this morning? Father, we come before you today and we thank you with joyful hearts that you are the reason for joy, that you truly brought joy to the world. We all have the hope. We all have, have the ability, Lord, to, to believe on you and to accept, Lord, the, the work that you have provided, the way that you provided for us, Lord, through your grace. And it gives us joy, and it gives us hope, and it gives us peace. And Lord, it's not just something that, that is a reality that, that we look at from history about 2,000 years ago, but it's a reality today. Lord, we can sing the words of that first song we sang today, Emmanuel, God with us, because you, you came down to earth, Lord, to be born as a baby. You came down to earth to live among men as a man. You gave your life for our sins. But then three days later, you rose in victory over sin, over death, over hell, over Satan, Lord. And today, you are with us, Lord. You can, we can have a vibrant relationship with you as our living and risen Savior. And we thank you for that. And we praise you. And Lord, we pray that you would help this joy that you've given us to overflow to the point that we don't just keep all of these things for ourselves. We don't keep it quiet. Lord, but we go out to the highways and byways and we, we share this message of salvation with the world around us. Lord, there is so much hurting, so much pain in this world. Lord, this Christmas season, often our hearts and minds are turned to, to what you've done for us and perhaps to what we can do for others. We, we give and, and we're generous and, and we recognize that that's a big part of the Christmas season. But Lord, as the church, as Christians, as your people, as the body of Christ, I pray that you would help us to recognize our responsibility to be your hands and your feet as we as we reach out to this community around us. Lord, yes, to meet their, their social, physical needs, Lord, whether that be uh, some, some good food to eat, uh, a warm place to stay, perhaps some warm clothing to wear, uh, just basic necessities. Those things are important. Those needs are important for the church to meet as well. But Lord, I pray that most importantly, you would help us as your church to, to understand, Lord, how important it is for us to share the message of salvation, to be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. Lord, help us to live differently. Help us to live in such a way that if people were to follow our example, we would lead them to you. But I pray that you would help us also to, to have the wherewithal, to have the knowledge and the, the ability to be able to share verbally, Lord, the message of salvation. Because oftentimes when we do live differently, people will recognize the difference. They'll recognize that, that wow, you know, that these difficult things are happening, but this person has joy. This person has peace in the midst of it all. And they, they may come to us and they may ask us the reason for that joy, the reason for the hope that we have. And I pray that you would help us all to be able to articulate clearly the message of salvation, the message of the gospel. Lord, oftentimes I think that those opportunities will come through our suffering. And there are people that are here today that are suffering. There are people here today that have needs and, and are carrying burdens, Lord, many, many physical needs. There are those who are who are battling physically. Perhaps it's cancer, perhaps it's some other sort of sickness. Lord, I know that, that Brother Wall is, is still needing, uh, needing prayer. He wasn't uh, feeling up to coming out in this weather today. We pray that you would continue to have your hand upon him. Lord, we're so grateful to see Brother Elmer here with us today just in the hospital for a couple of days this last week, and we're grateful for how you had your hand upon him. We pray that you would continue to strengthen him. I know that there are others here today that, that aren't feeling well, or aren't doing well, and we pray that you have your hand upon them. We pray in Jesus' name, if it's your will, that you would heal them. But most importantly, and, and really the whole crux of what we're praying today, we want to bring you glory and honor. And we, we pray that, that if it's your will for us to continue suffering, that we would be good sufferers for your honor and your glory. And that in some way you would use even these difficult circumstances that we may find ourselves in, Lord, to draw us closer to you and to enable us to lead others also to, to you. And Lord, we, we want to bring you glory and honor in everything that we do, of, of course, in this service. This is a time that's been set aside for us to worship you and praise you and lift up your name. And I, I pray that that would be done, Lord, that you would receive our, our, our sacrifice of praise to you. And that it would be an offering that's, that's worthy of, of you and all that you've done for us. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to present our bodies, the entirety of our lives, as a living sacrifice to you. Not just what we do in this service, Lord, but what we do throughout the week. 
And Lord, we want you to be honored and glorified through everything that's said and done in this service, everything that we say and do throughout the week, whether we're, we're going to school or, or at work or talking with our neighbors. And Lord, we, uh, we, we want to be all that you would have us to be as a church, as believers, as your disciples. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. You may be seated. The choir is going to sing this time.
Aren't you thankful for the reality, the truth of that song? Bethlehem morning, that morning that happened. Uh, of course, taking a little bit of poetic license there. We don't know for sure what time it happened. But it's more than just a memory uh, because he lives today. And you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. And I also have faith and believe that one day he's going to return again. He's going to take those of us who have believed on him back to live with him in heaven for all of eternity. Uh, what a beautiful, beautiful truth. And I trust that you have believed on him and trusted on him this morning. We're going to continue our worship through our giving. And, uh, and we are so, so very grateful to God for all the <coughs> blessings that he's given to us. And so we take this time. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't demand anything of us. He doesn't ask for much. But we do believe that it's scriptural to give a 10% tithe of all the blessings that God has given to us. So we'll do that as we continue to worship this morning. Jeremy, would you ask the Lord's blessing on the author? Lord, we thank you for this day. The day that we can come into your house to worship you and just listen and draw closer to you. We ask that as we receive this offering, that you will uh, take it and bless it and use it to the furtherance of your kingdom. Bless the gift, bless the giver, and help each one of us do everything we can. Please know our I uh, pray. Amen. Amen.
Normally, when we want to look at an account of a Christmas story, we turn to chapter 2 in the book of Luke. But we're going to read from a different passage today. Can you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1? Matthew chapter 1. Uh, Matthew 1, if you begin reading there, you'll see that it starts with a, with a listing of names. It's the, it's the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And uh, Matthew's primary audience, uh, as he wrote his book, was the Jewish people. And so it was very important for him to speak to the things that were important to them, that they needed to hear, the things they needed to hear. They were looking for the Messiah to be born of a certain family. And so he begins his gospel with, with a pedigree uh, of Jesus. We're not going to read through the whole list of names this morning, so you can rest easy. Uh, but Matthew mentions a, a, a couple of specific points in the genealogy of Jesus, some names that, that would have been of, of specific interest to his Jewish audience. He writes about Jesus, earthly ancestor, David, the founder of the royal line. Obviously, anyone who was to be a ruler in Israel had to be a descendant of that family line. The Jewish people would have been familiar with the words of the prophet Nathan regarding King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 13 to 16, where he said, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So these people, they knew these things. They knew that the king had to come from the Davidic line. Matthew also points out Abraham, who of course was the head of, of the covenant nation of Israel, who had received God's special promise that God would bless his descendants. The Jewish people would also have been very familiar with this promise that God had given to their patriarch in Genesis 22, 18. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice, God told Abraham. To be honest, if we were, take the, if we were to take the time to read the entire genealogy found here, and we listed each name, a lot of those names probably wouldn't mean very much to most of us here. Because our time and our culture is so far removed from the original audience. But rest assured, this list of names meant something to the original audience. It did, for sure. 
and it means something for us today, more actually, than first meets the eye. And, and we'll look at that in a moment, but let's begin reading together in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1 here. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. There's a reason that this isn't the passage that we typically look at to tell us the Christmas story. For one thing, it starts with a long list of names. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to turn that into a compelling part of a Christmas drama. It's, it's almost like when, uh, especially the older movies used to do it, but movies that start with the credits. You know, you, I don't really care to see all the names, so I just fast forward that part because I want to get to the, to the good parts. And then when you do get to the good parts here in Matthew chapter 1, there really isn't a whole lot of detail here. Uh, it's pretty much just the highlights. If this is all the story that we had, we'd never know about the trip to Bethlehem. We would never know about the stable, the manger, the shepherds. We wouldn't know anything about the wise men. All those cool facets of the Christmas story that we've all grown up to know and to love. But if you take the time to look carefully here in this passage, in this, uh, this telling of the Christmas story, there are some wonderful lessons that we can learn from the Christmas story right here in Matthew chapter 1. And the first thing that we learn is this. God uses ordinary people to accomplish His plan. Aren't you grateful for that? Amen. God uses ordinary people to accomplish His plan. We actually learned this from the genealogy that we didn't read together uh, this morning. Sometimes when we read the Bible and we get to one of those lists of long names, you know, we just sort of speed up and we skim through it. Uh, that's at least that's the way I read often. And I'm uh, just being honest with you. Okay, so and so begat uh, such and such, who in turn begat what's his name, and begat what you would call it, and all these names. And if we go down the list, we don't really put a whole lot of stock into that stuff. Because as we said before, our culture is so far removed from the original audience, and it takes a little bit more work for us to understand and, and derive a little meaning from it. But if you'll take a look at this list of people who make up the earthly ancestry of Jesus Christ himself, you'll notice a few names that, that don't look like they belong. As I read through the list of, of, of names of Jesus' ancestors, I noticed that there were, there were heroes of the faith. Some were wicked. Some weren't even Jews. In fact, it's not often that women are listed in genealogies because the family name is carried on through the men, but there are women listed here. Of course, the Virgin Mary herself is listed, but besides her are Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Tamar worked her way into the genealogy deceitfully and sinfully with her father-in-law, Judah. And, and uh, then uh, Rahab was a harlot and not even Jewish. She was a Canaanite. Ruth wasn't Jewish either. She was a Moabite woman. Bathsheba committed adultery with King David. Three of these women that are in this list are known for their sin. Two of them were not even Israelites. Why is it that the names of these women found their way into Jesus' genealogy? This is something that scholars have debated for centuries, but I think this is why. I think that God wanted to send the message that His Son, whom He was sending into the world, was coming as the friend of sinners. Even as the family of, of sinners. A kinsman redeemer. And that this Savior was coming to be the Savior of every tribe, every nation, to Jews as well as to Gentiles. And that's us. We're Gentiles. Jesus came to be your Savior. Amen. But reading those names... 
that don't seem to belong on this list also shows me that God uses ordinary people to accomplish His will. And if He can use them, He can use me. And if He wanted to use them, He probably wants to use me. I'm afraid that often, what often happens is, is we defeat ourselves when it comes to, to assessing our worth to the kingdom with reminders of our own inadequacy. We might feel like God is leading us to be involved in something or, or God wants to use us for something, but instead of, of making ourselves available to Him, we say, I can't do it. I, I'm inadequate. Use somebody else. You see, that's a byproduct of, of the way we've been hardwired to think. You want to be successful in life? You've got to be talented enough. Or you've got to have the right connections or the right circumstances. You want this job? You've got to be skilled enough. You want this or that? You've got to be smart enough. You've got to be good enough. You've got to be strong enough. But the cool thing is that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that's not really the way it works. It's in our weaknesses that God really shows himself. It's in our failures that he can show forgiveness. It's in the problems of life that He can show His grace. It's in the hurts that He can show His healing. It's in times of depression that He can show joy that, that stays with you. It's in sickness that He can show that He's got strength for you. God doesn't operate anything like the rest of the world operates. In the list of people who get credit for being in the ancestral background of the Savior of the world are people who are totally unqualified for the distinction. For one reason or another, God can and will use anyone that He wants to accomplish His purposes. And I can promise you that He wants to use you. And that has nothing to do with your pedigree or your qualifications. The Matthew 1 account of the Christmas story teaches us that God uses ordinary people to accomplish His plan. Maybe the thought of that doesn't necessarily make you feel good. Maybe you're thinking, God wants to use me, me specifically, in some great kingdom-building venture, and, and those thoughts you're having don't give you the warm fuzzies. Maybe even after what we just said about the way that God operates, the thought that God wants to use you still fills you with, with feelings of inadequacy. Maybe a little bit of fear. Maybe, maybe you feel a little bit overwhelmed at the thought, the idea that God wants to use you to build His kingdom. Well, take comfort in this next truth. We also learn from this passage that when I don't know what to do, I can count on God to show me. When I don't know what to do, I can count on God to show me. I can count on God to give me direction. Mary stayed with her cousin Elizabeth for three months after Gabriel announced to her that she would be the mother of Jesus you can imagine that after being away from home for a three-month period of time and then going back, it wasn't very long before her family and friends realized that she was pregnant. Of course, Joseph also realized that she was pregnant after having been away for a while, and understandably, he was very upset. Something that doesn't fully translate to our modern culture here in America is where the Bible tells us that Mary and Joseph were betrothed. It was somewhat like an engagement, but quite a bit more binding. Because only a legal writ of divorce could break that, that betrothal. And if anyone in that day was betrothed to be married and willfully committed an act of infidelity, it was considered a clear case of adultery, which of course carried very serious repercussions. That Mary was with child and that that child was not Joseph's was a very, very big deal. If Joseph went ahead and married Mary, it would look like he was admitting guilt and, and that he had been a participant in the infidelity and the adultery. Because while only divorce could break their agreement, they were still considered unmarried. He was innocent. He didn't want to seem like he was admitting guilt for something that he didn't do. But on the other hand, if he divorced her, it would mean public shame and disgrace, possibly even stoning her to death. We all know the story. But after what could only have been an agonizing time of indecision for Joseph, he finally decided to divorce Mary privately, keep it secret, try to protect her. While he was thinking about it, verse 20 in our passage tells us that God came to him and revealed to him exactly what he wanted him to do. I highly doubt that any of us have been in the same predicament as Joseph, but all of us have been in situations where we just weren't sure what to do. We had no idea the next step to take. 
That sort of thing happens all the time. The way through those situations is to trust. Trust in the one who has an ultimate plan. And who has assured each of us that he wants us to be a part of it in some way. We can all relate to the agony that Joseph must have felt as he debated within himself the right course of action to take. What should I do? What decision should I make? No doubt all of us have, have, have at different points in our lives come before God in desperation asking him for some sort of guidance for our lives. An answer to our problems. God, I just need a yes or a no here. What do I do? Make it plain and simple for me. Elizabeth Elliot she tells of two adventurers who stopped by to see her, all loaded with, with equipment for, for their rainforest uh, adventure east of the Andes. They didn't ask her for any advice, any insight, just a few phrases that they could use to converse with the Indians. They wanted a little bit of, of, of language uh, that they could use. And She wrote these words after her interaction with these men. Sometimes we come to God as the two adventurers came to me, confident and we think well-informed and well-equipped. But has it occurred to us that with all our accumulation of stuff, something is missing? She suggests that we often ask God for too little. We know what we need. We, we, we think we come and we need a yes or no answer, please, to a simple question. Or perhaps a road sign, something quick and easy to point the way. What we really ought to have is the guide himself. Maps, road signs, a few useful phrases are things, but infinitely better is someone who has been there before and knows the way. When you're in a tough spot and you don't know what to do, you can count on God to show you the way. But you need to be in tune with His heart and His voice because chances are His guidance won't exactly be in line with what you would have had in mind. We like things simple. We want to say, God, just show us. When God wants us to say, God, we want you. Something tells me that Joseph never dreamed that his future wife's first child would be conceived of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus ascended, ascended into heaven, he promised his disciples that after him would come the Helper. And, 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 and that was his name for the Holy Spirit. That, that's who we have to help us, the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus even said that it was better for us that he was going back to heaven and that the Holy Spirit was coming. And so it stands to reason that the more you have of the Helper, the clearer the path before you, the easier it is to find the answers that you need, even in the most difficult of circumstances. You tell me, what would you rather have if you were lost in the wilderness? Would you rather have a map in your own hands or a park ranger who comes along and says, Oh, I know these trails like the back of my hand. I'll take you to where you need to go. Which one would you rather have? Of course you'd rather have the person that knows. You'd rather have the trail guide. God, help us every day to empty more and more of self, of what we think we bring to the table, our selfish ambition, our own ideas, to empty more and more of that from our lives and accept more and more the guidance of the Helper. Not a day goes by that I am not faced in some way, sometimes small and sometimes large, with my own inadequacy and inability to do justice to the call that God has placed on my life. I sure am thankful that when I don't know what to do, which is often, I can count on God to guide me. But I've got to be in tune to His voice. I've got to be surrendered to His will to his direction and his leadership in my life. It sure is comforting to know that God uses ordinary people to accomplish his will. And that means he can use me. It's wonderful to recognize that when I don't know what to do, I can count on God to guide me, knowing that God wants to use me. He has a plan specifically for my life. And knowing that when it's beyond me and, and, and when I don't know what to do, I can count on God to show me the way. Those are, those are two big components in the recipe for true fulfillment in the life of a Christian. But the tr third truth found in Matthew 1 is this. True fulfillment and fullness of life comes only with total obedience to God. True fulfillment and fullness of life comes only with total obedience to God. Verse 24 of our passage simply says, When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He simply obeyed. 
And Joseph's heart of obedience was more than just in that moment. He wasn't just obedient in that he took Mary to be his wife as the angel commanded. Joseph showed a, a heart of humble obedience to the principles of God's word and an understanding of the truths that we've covered today. Even when Joseph thought that he had been wronged by Mary, he was still uh, careful to search for a way to be both just and merciful to her. How do you react when you've been wronged? Not just what is your physical reaction. I, I sure hope that you're a mature and, uh, enough adult to be able to, to control that and not, not lash out and swing out. But how do you react when you've been wronged? What's the attitude of your heart when you've been wronged? We would all do well to follow Joseph's example. And of course, Joseph was simply following the example of his heavenly father. No doubt Joseph was frustrated and anxious about his situation. But he was able to rest in the understanding that God was working behind the scenes to accomplish his will. He had a heart of, of submission and obedience to God's will. And to God's right to impose his will on Joseph's life. Peter T. Forsyth was right when he said, The first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. I have to believe that in a way, Joseph understood the truth of the words the Apostle Paul would write several years later. You are not your own, so glorify God in your body. Joseph was surrendered to God's plan for his life. It sure didn't look much like the plan that he had. But his heart of surrender led to obedience. And God used Joseph as part of his incredible plan to save the world. God uses ordinary people to accomplish his plans. That means you. God has a plan for your life. And chances are it's beyond your ability to accomplish on your own. You ever heard that phrase, God never gives you more than you can handle? Have you ever heard that before? Well, it's not true. It's not true. That isn't what the Bible says. The Bible specifically says that God will allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able to handle. But I go through things all the time that are way beyond my ability to handle on my own. Joseph sure did. And Joseph was about to make the wrong decision. That's why it's great to know that when I don't know what to do, I can count on God to God to give me direction. In Hebrews 13, 5, God promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. But I can only expect true fulfillment and fullness of life with total obedience on my part to the will of God. To, with, with total uh, resignation and surrender to what he tells me to do, to his leadership. Just like Joseph, I must have a heart of submission and obedience to God's will and to God's right to impose his will on my life. I must Follow him with complete and total surrender if I want to be fulfilled, if I want to be truly satisfied, if I want to have true fullness of life. Is there anybody here today who doesn't want to have fullness of life? Who doesn't want to be satisfied and fulfilled in everything that you do? I don't think so. But I'm telling you right now, the only way to achieve that, the only way to know that, is to completely and totally surrender and walk in full surrendered obedience to him as he leads and as he guides God wants to use you. God has a plan for your life. It's probably going to be a difficult plan. It probably is. It sure was for these people that we've looked at at the Christmas story and, and that we talk about often. Often when we think of the beautiful parts of the story, we don't think about how absolutely difficult, impossible seeming this was in the moment for Mary and for Joseph. God has a plan for your life. He wants to use you. And it probably is going to be a difficult but you can rest assured that God will guide you. He'll lead you. He'll direct you. When you don't know what to do, He will show you the way. And then if you want to be fulfilled, you'll follow where He leads. You'll, you'll go where He guides. You'll do what He directs. God help us to walk in humble surrender, understanding that He has a purpose and a plan and a will for our lives and being completely surrendered to that plan, but also knowing that when we don't know what to do and when the plan is beyond our own abilities, which often it will be, we can trust in Him to guide us and to lead us and to help us and God help us to submit to that. Would you stand with me this morning?